All right, let's look at stroke. Like I said, it's, we've already winnowed the majority of this during CPR. It's the same as a heart attack, except to the brain. You know, they call it a brain attack. You know, lay people sometimes call it a brain attack. It's when there's a clogged artery or vessel in the brain. It cuts off oxygen to that area of the brain and causes that area of the brain to infarct, right? Sounds familiar, correct? Or it should. It sounds like a heart attack. It's just in a different organ, so it blocks off the blood to the brain. Some different strokes, or the vessel could rupture. Anybody take a guess what a ruptured vessel, what type of stroke, what the name of a stroke is that's from a ruptured vessel? What is, what, what's, hap, what's happening in the brain? The bleeding, right? So what would the stroke be called? Huh? Yeah, pretty much, pretty close. A hemorrhagic stroke. So a hemorrhage stroke or hemorrhagic stroke, right? Because they're bleeding. So you have one that's caused from a blockage of some sort, or you have a hemorrhagic stroke that's caused from bleeding. Or this one that's from the, uh, a blockage could also be called an ischemic stroke. So you have ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. The good thing, again, for you, the treatment's the same. The appearances are a little different. We'll get talking more about this, uh, like a uh, bleeding in the brain during trauma when we talk about head injury. But... Here, for the stroke, your treatment would remain the same. Other things that, you, one thing that you see is hemiparesis. Hemi means one side or one side of weakness. So that's why during your assessment of the stroke patient, you ask them to squeeze your hand, push down on your feet to see if they have equal grip strength and equal plantar flexion. Uh, headache, this could be caused from the Ischemia also could be caused from the ruptured vessel as well. But that's sort of hard to discern about the headache. Uh, most stroke patients have hypertension, or they're having a hypertension crisis. So at that point, so the headache could be caused from the hypertension. But you see the one-sided weakness, the headache, the dizziness. Anytime that you feel any sort of pain, you get sort of nauseated, so... Those are all common signs. So the nausea, confusion. Where do you think the confusion comes from? Right, lack of oxygen. They don't, they're cerebral hypoxia. Numbness, paralysis, uh, loss of bowel and bladder control. All those are neurological functions. And then the hypertension that we see Vision, I haven't seen a lot of impaired visions over stroke patients. All these others, well, fortunately, I hadn't seen a lot of bowel or bladder loss of that control either. But uh, hypertension, almost always, some confusion, some altered mental status, uh, one-sided weakness, headache, all those are very common when we, when we start looking at strokes. Then you just get the nausea and vomiting. You could have a seizure. Seizure primarily due to the cerebral hypoxia, maybe the bleeding, the pressure in the brain. The unequal pupil size, we'll learn about that during head injuries, but also that's a, where the blood is uh, building up in the brain and causes brain stem herniation. That's where we start seeing the, uh, the difference in pupils. Headache, you know, just due to the pressure, you know, sort of like a uh, real bad sinus headache. Anybody really had a real bad sinus headache? Uh, that's the type of headache that they feel, that pressure in their head, you know. The bad thing about being in medicine is you lay there and you have a sinus headache, and you go, oh, I hope this is not a stroke. <laughs> you know, because very well could be. You get a headache and some dizziness from that. That pain causes nausea. Anyway, most of the time it's a sinus headache. Uncommon, very uncommon is unconsciousness unless the stroke has advanced to the point where it's almost fatal. They become unconscious when it's becoming fatal. 
in, in the stroke. They have a, this difficulty of communication. That's one of the uh, aphasia. It's a term meaning difficulty speaking. That's why the uh, you use this term fast. And we went over this during uh, CPR, right? F A S T. And this is one way that you tell that they're having a stroke. This is from the American Heart Association. So to go in here in a few minutes, but when we start looking at signs and symptoms, but you use this uh, acronym FAST. Anybody remember this? Face, facial drooping, right? What about the arm? Oh, I can't dance away. A, arm, arm drift, right? And then speech. What about T? Time. It's time. Good. So that acronym works. So you look for facial drooping, you look for arm drift, speech, you ask them to say Jack and Jill ran up the hill or something, some easy sentence that they could say, and it, it might come out and you're like, Jack is in a little bit of you know, a <laughs> little intoxicated or something, you know. And then time is very important. Three hours from the onset of a stroke, the patient needs to be transported to a stroke center. So as an EMT, that's your responsibility to know where the stroke centers are. If you've been in Dallas, Dallas Regional and they call it Code Stroke. Have you all been there? Uh, I think they're a stroke center. Lake Point's a stroke center. All the big hospitals are stroke centers. You know, so they can, uh, they can take care of these patients. When they do this, when they're within that time frame and they're a stroke center, and this has happened to me, they don't even stop in the emergency room. Like we would bring this patient in, pa patient's obviously had a stroke, you know, he's dysphagic, weakness, you know, all the classic signs. Doctor comes up, talks to him, and points us towards the uh, CT. So we go, we bypass the ER and go straight to a CAT scan. They want to know what's going on in that head. Sort of the same way a coach STEMI with a heart. You know, lots of, you won't spend much time in the emergency room. You're going towards the cath lab a lot of the time. Because they figured out, the faster they get them in to the treatment, and they figured out they're having a heart attack or they're having a stroke, the better outcome. And that time frame is uh, around three hours. After three hours, they may not be as aggressive. But within the first three hours of a stroke, they need to go to a stroke center. And trust me, elderly people who are more common to have strokes, they won't wait three hours to call. As soon as Pops is having trouble speaking or altered mental status, they're calling 911. You know, if, if someone's uh, around them to look at them. All right? So... You have, when you look at the strokes, remember you have the ischemic stroke or the one that's formed by the clot or the blockage and the hemorrhagic stroke. The signs and symptoms mirror each other. There's very few differences between the signs and symptoms. Now here what will cause confusion is called a TIA or transit ischemic attack. Transit means in and out. So like gypsies. You know, they're in and out. But they just have the signs and symptoms <coughs> Uh, for typically less than 24 hours. Most of the time, these signs and symptoms go away as soon as you put oxygen on them. They start, the signs and symptoms start going away. So they're having a TIA, or transit ischemic attack, where they're mirroring signs of uh, having a stroke, but those symptoms go away with oxygen or within the first cup, uh, within the first 24 hours. Is your treatment any different? No, you'd still treat it like a stroke. You'd, you'd see all the signs and symptoms of a stroke, and you would treat it as a stroke. If the signs and symptoms dissolve, then that's good. They're having a TIA, which typically can build into a, a stroke or a CVA, cerebral vascular accident, but they, uh, <clears throat> they will resolve themselves. Still probably don't get a CAT scan. See if anything's taking place in the brain. So we looked at Cincinnati's stroke scale. 
We should look at this guy, his weird uh, mouth, and the smile on his face. You ask the patients to smile, and they get this sort of slant to their, uh, to their face. Now, if they've already had a stroke, you have to take that into accountability, right? Account, because they could have this from their last stroke. But a new on- onset of stroke symptoms, you could see this, the smile all jacked up, all right? Then you'd get the uh, uh, arm drift, they'd hold out their hands, and then really short amount of time, one of that arm, one of the arms would start to drop. Usually, the deficit, where the deficit is, like the arm dropping, the stroke is on the opposite side. That means nothing to us, but that just tells you that the stroke's on this side. One thing that you have to remember with someone, let's say they have paralysis on their left side, So we know they're having a stroke on their right side. But any deficit, any extremity where there's a deficit, you wouldn't do any needle sticks or you wouldn't take any blood pressure. So you take the blood pressure on the unaffected arm. What about if they're both? You use like legs. No, you just use the leg. Take the the blood pressure on the cat. It's a little bit more difficult and it will be higher. So you... You sort of have to think about that a little bit. But try your best not to use the affected extremity. And most of the time it's just one extremity. It's hemiparalysis, unless there's a big bleed in the head. So the uh, the sky's blue in Cincinnati, or Jack and Jill went up the hill. Uh, Whatever sort of catchphrase that you want to use, just to see if they can pronounce the simple words directly without the slur to check the speech. All right, so maintain them, reassure the patient like you always do, do your good ABCs, monitor the airway, they, need, they may need to be suctioned. All right. Uh, really watch the airway, high concentration of oxygen, you can never go wrong with an honorary breather. Right. And they need to be sitting upward, up at a 45 degree angle in a semi-fowler position. This is sort of a weird thing, okay, because if you set the patient up, the more you set upright, the higher your intracranial pressure is, your ICP. So, uh, it's, at times it's better to lay like flat, because when you lay flat, the intracranial pressure drops. Like me, I'm standing upright. My intracranial pressure is lower than yours because your legs are bent. So the, there's, but they do recommend a semi-fowler's position, mainly to uh, protect the airway. If you can get them flat, and if they lay flat, flat's better. Lowers their intracranial pressure, and that's in a stroke. They're having in the ICP is elevated. That's one of the main, big main problems with the stroke. It's a high intracranial pressure. Unconscious person, open their airway, same as you would with any unconscious person. Put them on a recovery position, either the right or left side, the unaffected side, and provide high concentration of oxygen. And really, you can't do anything ALS-wise for a stroke, except transport them, you know, to the right facility. Make sure that they have a CAT scan. Try your best to get them to a stroke center, and uh, that would be the best care for the patient. The oxygen that you're giving them is the the best drug that they need at that point, uh, unless they have a blood pressure problem. And then it's, the blood pressure problem is out of your hands, but give them that oxygen. And make sure that you document. They want good, accurate account of when this started because just like in a heart attack, there's a timeline there. So they need a good timeline of when the stroke began, when the symptoms began, uh, so they can provide the right care. All right. Everybody good with the stroke? Remember that from CPR? Quickly, we'll talk about dizziness and syncope or fainting. Just about anything can make a person dizzy. Uh, The barometric pressure change can make you dizzy. 
Uh, smelling. Uh, I get dizzy and a headache when I go in bath and body because I can't stand all the scents. All right. Uh, fever. Hypoglycemia. There's a, there's a big laundry list of things that can cause you to do this. Not necessarily syncope, fainting. There shouldn't be that many reasons to cause a person to faint. Because if they faint and become unconscious, what is it affecting? What's that center in the brain? Can I remember that? Oh, good. You're right. The RAS for the reticular activating system. So there's not a, a number of good reasons for them to faint. A lot of people faint because they get up too fast. Uh, uh, and, and their blood pressure drops. Or they're so sick that... You know, they try to get up and they get dizzy and they just fall back down. Actually, passing out and having a period of unconsciousness is a little bit more rare than what most people think. Most people think, oh, I got dizzy, I stood up, and I fainted. Well, they got dizzy, if you get the total story, they got dizzy, they got lightheaded, and they sat down, but they didn't actually lose consciousness because they remember doing everything that they did, right? Someone that faints really don't remember the hitting the ground, correct? Uh, it's just, I think I told you the story about the lady that can't move her legs. We got the other day, right? Went on a call, said the lady can't move her legs. She fell, or she hurt her, her, she hurt her back earlier that day, or the day, the night before, and now she can't move her legs. Well, that's a big thing, right? Can't move your legs? Wow. That's spinal. Did, did she sever a spinal nerve? Why can't she move her legs? So we're thinking about this as we're going to the call, and we're thinking, this could be fairly serious. So we get in there, the lady's upright, alert, and oriented, laying on the couch, back pain from moving her child. All right, so we're looking at that going, all right, why can't you move your legs? Because I don't know, I just can't move them. I'm like, well, try. Lift your legs up. And so, here's your legs. What do you think she did? She moved her She didn't move your legs. Oh. I said, well, try to lift them up. And she lifted both her legs up, one at a time. She goes, see, well, you can move your legs. So, say, so the decrease, the possibilities are starting to decrease. Touch her and say, Can you feel me touching you? Because I can feel it, but it, it feels numb. So, what do you think her problem was? You said you it? Um, huh? Okay, yeah, you're right. So, so, what happened? Why, did, why, why could she not move her legs? What? I think you said that. Huh? Circulation. Which would be what? To her legs. No. To her legs sleep, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what it was. She laid on the couch so long because of her back. She had back pain. She tweaked her back. But she laid on the back, the couch so long that her legs went numb. How, why did she not know how to move her legs? Why didn't she move her legs and get it just off the couch? And... She couldn't fall asleep. Yeah, I mean, they're falling asleep. Everybody knows when you're in extremity falls asleep, right? But why didn't she move? Why didn't... She was scrambling. Hmm? She was probably scrambling because she had fallen. That's true. The family is super paranoid that she hurt herself. But uh, it... That was one reason. The other reason was it hurt. It hurt to move. But it hurt her back, not her legs. I mean, she truly had a back pull or something, a strain. Right? She needed some medication. She was taking medication, trying to fix it. She was taking the wrong stuff. But she needed to move. She laid on the couch too long and her legs went to sleep. And she, wouldn't, she didn't want to move because it hurt her back too much. Now, I tell you all that to say here about the syncope is that sometimes you have to act, you have to sort of dig in and say, this doesn't seem normal, so you start asking enough questions to where you figure out the problem.
Because you need, like on this lady, was it a spinal injury? Or is it something else? Well, she can move her extremity, so it's not necessarily a spinal injury. So the same way with syncope or fainting, you have to really investigate that. Do you remember fainting? Do you remember any events of that? Did you remain conscious or were you unconscious? How long were you unconscious for? Uh, one thing about unconsciousness is that if you have a period greater than one minute of unconsciousness, they automatically CT your head. Any decent hospital will do that. So unconsciousness is a big thing. What most people say about unconsciousness is like back here. She's not unconscious. She may not want to get up, right? But she's not unconscious. So what happens is people get... When you ask bystanders how long were they unconscious, they get unconscious confused that they just didn't get up. They didn't open their eyes. They could have got up and opened their eyes if they would have woke, you know, get up type thing, right? But they just didn't do that. So they get that confused with the period of unconsciousness. So vertigo makes you dizzy. Uh, senses, smells. We could play loud. Well, you guys are probably tuned to loud music. But you could play a lot of loud noise. Loud noise will make you nauseated. The decimal level. Uh, and that, that could make you dizzy. So uh, just a number of things. Oxygen works well for both of all these. So if you have someone that's syncopal or uh, dizzy, oxygen. Probably the because you're ruling out things, remember, so you rule out some cerebral hypoxia, rule out some something just with oxygen, protect their airway, watch them, keep them from hurting themselves if they fall. You know, hypovolemia is a big one. Metabolic, they could be sick. Something could be going on in their body. Enzymes could be off. They could be acidotic, whatever. could be toxicology. There could be something in the air, a toxin in the air. Or, or cardiovascular-wise, why would they get dizzy and pass out cardiovascular-wise? Lack of oxygen in the, lack, in the what? Huh? All those, really. So, decrease in blood pressure, de decrease in heart rate, but what does a decrease in heart rate cause? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> we have blood flow, or what's the big word? Decrease in heart rate would cause a decrease in. Cardiac output, right. You decrease cardiac output, you decrease oxygen. And so all those goes together. A heart attack could, a big enough surface area heart attack could decrease cardiac output. So that could be cardiovascular wise. Low blood sugar, you always pass out low blood sugar. You know, you just get, like, you get, just get real sleepy and won't lay down. You don't have any energy. Whether you're diabetic or not, hop, oh, that says volemic, but I'm talking about hypoglycemia. You know, you can, you can do that, do that. Hypovolemia, decrease in fluid, decrease in blood, you're bleeding, same, same sort of deal, all right? Especially internal. Then we look at just the chemistry structure of the body. Inner ear problems is a huge one. Lady says, man, I sit there. She goes, every time I get up, I get dizzy and throw up. I throw up. I sit down, I'm fine. I get, I stand upright. I get extremely dizzy and I vomit. Two very classic signs of inner ear. Almost all the time, it's inner ear. You got this little, little small sand deal. I forget what it's called in your ear that keeps us balanced. You get an inner ear infection, it messes that up somehow. And it throws us out of balance. So when you get up, you get this from an inner ear infection. 
not life threatening, but requires medicine. You got to get some antibiotics to fix that. Of course, drugs can do it. Uh, alcohol and drugs, altered men mentation, you know, depending on what drugs you take. We talked about the cardiovascular things already, the bradycardia, the tachycardia decreases the cardiac output. Vasovagal response, that's when what you guys have when you go to the hospital, you know, and you pass out the hospital, okay? A lot of that's due to not eating, okay? You know, mainly when breakfast, when you were first year students, you went and you didn't eat, you had this vasovagal response, uh, it, uh, you activated the vagus nerve, you saw something that you didn't like, and then the vagus nerve uh, reacted, it, it dropped the heart rate down, and passed out. So that's a good, good sign of uh, syncope. The other thing that could, like locking your knees, if you're standing, if you're at a job that you stand at all day, a long time, you lock your knees, you lock your knees, Next thing you know, you're going to hit the floor. Same thing at the hospital. You're standing. You lock your knees up. You done that before, huh? I sit in the shower. Huh? Sit in the shower. Huh? How long is it like to sleep? Hmm. Band, right? You want to try it? <laughs> boot camp, that happened all the time. It happened to me in boot camp. It happened all the time. That would have been embarrassing in the shower, passing out. <laughs> um. Okay, so the same thing. You sort of ask, you ask the same questions as you go down through the stroke. And here, what do you mean dizziness? You know, you've got to sort of get a good definition of that. So you get the patient to tell you how they feel, and then you sort of base it on that. Sinus headache can cause you to be dizzy. You know, just a number of different things. Most of them are not life-threatening, uh, and uh, you just sort of have to figure out why, why are you doing this? Uh, the warning when it starts, just all typical questions. Are you still dizzy? How long did it last? You know, has this ever happened before? Those are always good assessment questions. If it's happened before, what happened? Oh, last time I had this, I had an inner ear infection. Well, you think that's what it is now? You know, probably so. Uh, medication. Did you take too much medication? You could have your prescription medication. You could accidentally overdose from that. Uh, you know, did you have an emotional type thing? Were you hyperventilated? So see, all these different things can take place. It's just a matter of us asking the right questions and trying to figure out why that is. Because it's abnormal, correct? So we're just trying to figure out through a process of questions to eliminate why why these abnormal things are taking place. So put them on high concentration of oxygen. You can always call for ALS backup. For dizziness and syncope, probably don't need it. All right. Protect their airway. Uh, prevent them from passing out again. Watch them to make sure that they don't pass out. And they'll do a... Uh, once you get into hospital type environment they're doing just so many different tests because that's such a broad thing dizziness and fainting that they don't know what's taking place so they're doing a, a lot of tests yeah all right everybody good ultra mental status what do we do when we uh have anyone with ultra mental status d stick you got to always remember that. That's probably the most important thing. Put an oxygen on the view of a D-stick. Uh, very important. 